Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the program. It's it is Tuesday. It is Tuesday. It is uh, November twenty eighth, and you're listening to the Jeff Gerstmann Show. Coming to you live and direct. If you're uh, li- if you're here live and direct um, in the evening time. Um, the last week has been it, it's. The last week has been still. The last week has been uh, f- fuck. It's, it's been it's been nonsense. Uh, the uh, uh, yeah. So let's see. We did the podcast Monday night last week because my daughter had started getting sick. Basically, you know, kids get sick all the time, and uh, we and then and, and, and then adults get sick too, and so we, we've been sick in some form since uh before halloween so for coming up on a month now um uh, i caught it uh much more seriously this time not i mean you know it's a cold right it's it's not you know it's not like i'm you know i don't need the saw bones to come out and look at me and amputate an arm to get the fever down or anything like that but uh you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been unpleasant. Um, but you know, both my, uh, old, well, both my toddlers, I guess that's the, I I, I can't say both now that we have three, but in this case, uh, in this case, my daughter got sick and then my son got sick and then I got sick. And uh, like we did last time, I'm trying to minimize this setup. This will probably be the last time we have to go through this fucking shit. But, uh, my daughter, my baby daughter, she's five or six weeks old. She has a breathing condition and, and absolutely cannot get sick because the, with the breathing condition combined with the illness is bad. So the doctor is like, Hey, don't, don't let this kid get sick. So my wife took the baby and ran off into the woods, you know, uh, to start a new life for herself. And, um, no, she went to go stay with family and stuff like that. Um, and so she came home today, but my son is still, you know, he's still coughing. He's still like hacking it up. And it's like a lingering garbage ass cough. Uh, and I'm still, you know, still kind of funky too. So I was like, okay. So we, we thought about it a while. I was like, okay, well, we, we don't want, we do not want the baby to get sick. And so reluctantly, I, I took the kid, I took the boy and we ran off into the, we ran off into the woods. Um, earlier today, and then I put him to bed there, and then it was just like, okay, the the internet bandwidth at this place is jacked, so I can't really do the podcast properly, and he's not sleeping well there, and no one's sleeping well here, so I'm just like, all right, well, the place is close enough that it's like, well, whatever, I can come back here, we can do nights here, and then days at this other place for the next couple of days, just to let him even out, I guess. I I don't know. That's, that's probably how it will go. Um, but, um, anyway, so I, I woke my son up and, and said, we're going home, buddy. And he said, da, 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 da. And then, uh, we jumped in the car and drove back and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so he's upstairs. Let, Let me get a look at him. Make sure he's still asleep. When Ricky was high, it was like he was Mr. Do. You ever see My Sweet Satan? You ever see the, the, the Jim Van Beber, uh, the Jim Van Beber classic, independent filmmaker? Uh, and uh, is, I don't know, sa- Satanist? I don't, I don't think he's actually into Satan. He's, it's, a, it's a telling of a real story, of a true, true story, My Sweet Satan. It's, it's a short film. It's like 20 minutes. About a guy, Ricky, Ricky the Acid King, does a lot of acid, murders some people for Satan, as you do, you know, down at the band shell. Uh, I have not seen much of his other work. There was another one about a forklift driver that got high all the time. I think he made that one as well. I don't know. Film Threat used to put just put out a bunch of VHS tapes, and then they would send a bunch of them to me for a brief period of time when I was writing for a magazine. And so a bunch of tapes showed up and one of them was my sweet Satan. I was like, well, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Um, 
And uh, there's a lot of great scenes in that film, one of which where word is getting around that Ricky has indeed got doses of, of LSD. And so like, Ricky's got doses? Ricky's got and then he, and then Ricky starts going doses, and then and then the guy they're all at a video store because they're all a bunch of fucking burnout acid head satanists, and it's the '90s, uh, so of course you're at a video store. I spent most of the '90s at a video store because a friend of mine worked there, and they had the best porno. Um, one time we laid down on the floor in the porno room, surrounded by all the tapes, letting their power become instilled in us. And, uh, well, I carry forth that Ed Powers to this day. Um, but yeah, I don't know, man, my sweet Satan, look it up. It's got a really crummy and amazing, uh, practical effects shot of a guy's head getting stomped. That's really, really fucking terrible. Um, it's, it's hilarious though. I mean, it's, it's a nice short film about the devil about uh about a uh, 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 guy who loves to do acid and loves satan in, i think in that order if you asked him he probably would have said the other thing but unfortunately we cannot ask the you know again based on a true story but unfortunately the uh the person who did perpetrate this actual crime is no longer with us he's he's passed on um What were we talking about? Oh, anyway, so so my son's asleep, looks like my daughter's asleep. Um and here we are podcasting. I wanna get yeah, you know, I it's uh, you know, like I, I feel like all these shows start with this preamble now because it's just like how crazy the last month has been. So I'm sorry for like recapping it every time for people, uh, but but you know, it's it's such a weird I can't just say the end part because if you haven't heard it in the lead up to it, it just sounds insane. Um, anyway, uh, I brought my steam deck, you know, uh, on the, on the road. And that was, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was, that was part of the plan. So I got an OLED steam deck that showed up. I have unboxed it. I have set it all up. It is now, uh, my, my good to go steam deck, my old steam deck, I have put back in its case and I am pondering what to do with it. Um, it's, it's very nice. The OLED screen. Very nice. It's a, it's a steam deck. It feels like the, <clears throat> on paper, the, the weight difference doesn't seem like it would be enough to matter, but it does feel lighter in the hand. Um, and it is, you know, it's the transparent limited edition one. It looks, it looks nice. You get the, the power light bleeds through from the front. And, uh, so either you're into that or you're not, um, you know, I, I, sometimes I play it while it's charging. So you see the, you see that light and, and whatever else. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I loved the original steam deck. It's a solid piece of machinery. This one is better than that one. I don't know that I have too much more to say about it that hasn't already been picked apart to death from people doing, you know, proper benchmarky type stuff. Uh, benchmarky D is one of the fat boys. Uh, along with Buffy, who was the, the beatboxer of the, of the, of the three. Can't currently remember the name of, uh, it's Prince Marky D. God rest his soul. There's the other rapper whose name escapes me at the moment, and I feel bad about that. And there's Buffy, who, who did the, the beatboxing. Yes, Violent J, that's him. Yes, that's the one. Violent J, uh, Game Changer Wrestling's uh, part of the trio's team, Insane Clown Bussy. Uh, Violent J. Uh, Violent J did some wrestling recently, uh, with, uh, with a tag team, uh, known as, as Bussy, 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 Bussy. And he came out to the ring, uh, they came out to the ring and, uh, they were playing the insane clown posse classic chicken hunting, hunting, um, 
one of their most famous jams, especially from the Joker's card era, I would say. Um, and he came out and he was singing the lyrics to Chicken Hunting, and the crowd wanted none of it. The crowd had no idea what was going on. And I felt bad, but also I felt like all was right with the world because a crowd in 2023 attending a wrestling show probably shouldn't know every word to the insane clown posse classic chicken hunting. So he's sitting there going, who's going chicken hunting? And then he's holding the mic up and you just see all these people in the crowd just going like, what? Um, and on one hand, I felt bad for Violent J. On the other hand, I felt like, well, that's cool that he's out wrestling. He supposedly had some health issue, issue that they were going to stop touring. Uh, but apparently he can get in the ring and take some bumps or something. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he's not bumping. I didn't, I didn't watch the whole match. Um, <laughs> anyway, shout out to Violent J, uh, who I saw unboxing flavors of Fago on Instagram recently. Glenn sent me a link to, to, to that. And I was like, man. The influencer hustle comes for us all, doesn't it? It's very weird. Seeing Violent J opening a, a box of Fago, like rare Fago flavors or or whatever, um, on the on the internet, I was like, because because back in the day, I feel like, and then you know, this just maybe goes to show where everyone is at these days, right? Back in the day, it felt like when asked in interviews. If you if they went to Fago and said, "What do you think about um, these uh, vulgar clown rappers who were sh like spraying your drink all over crowds across the Midwest uh, while in clown and clown makeup?" and they would kind of go like, "Well, that's we think you should drink it. I don't know about spraying it. I, they you know they buy it like everybody else. I don't know." Like they were very hands off, like we're not necessarily affiliated with those fucking guys. <laughs> and now it looks like they're sending influencer packages to Violent J with <laughs> fucking flavors of Fago. And I was just like, man, how times have changed. Am I right? Um <laughs> The Steam Deck, the the OLED Steam Deck, I mean, you know, hey, an OLED screen really goes a long way. It also is HDR. So, you know, games that support that are going to benefit. I installed Res Infinite on it. Um, what did I install? I installed a hand, you know, Street Fighter 6 was a, was a must. Um, but I had a bunch of games installed on my other Steam Deck that I just wasn't playing a lot of. But it was just like, it was cool. The idea of being able to play it was cool. I put Diablo 4 on the new one. It's like, oh, well, it's got HDR. I thought to myself, if I'm going to play any more Diablo 4, which is a pretty big if, I'm probably going to play it on the Steam Deck. Um, so, um, I think it's just fantastic. Slightly better battery life. Um, uh, Wi-Fi uh, 6E, so technically capable of faster downloads. Yes, that's right. Uh, Manic, uh, Manic Pixie Dream Boy in chat says Rez's birthday was last Wednesday, 22 years. Yeah. Yep, Rez. Um, Rez is a tremendous video game. Uh, it's great that it's available in so many different places. Um, you know, the idea that I can install it on a, a handheld steam deck type you know and now at this point i, I think i have um hmm. there's technically three copies of res on my steam deck because res infinite is on there as well as the dreamcast version of res and the playstation 2 version of res uh which i i copied over onto the uh the all the all sd card um this game boy games look great on an oled display you know they're just uh no, I, I, uh, I'm doing a lot of emulating on the old Steam Deck. That's a, a big part of the draw. I, I don't know. I don't know if you use TikTok. Um, I talked a little bit about this, but uh, TikTok has become even more of a vast wasteland recently. It's fucking crazy. So they, um, 
So they have added uh, the, the TikTok shop. And uh, I think you can sell whatever on there, but also, but the idea is that they are, they have a shop full of trash. There's a bunch of fucking garbage that can be sold directly on TikTok now. Um, and uh, it looks like they're trying to go after the like team the, 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 the AliExpress uh, style. Look at all this drop shipped fucking trash. But because it's TikTok and it's a video platform, you don't just go to a store and scroll through things. As you're scrolling through your feeds and you're like, I want to see the ladies shake it. Uh, you, you eventually come upon like all these live streams of just like people holding all those like cheap Amber Nick and uh, the, the MiU and all those other emulator focused cheap ass devices. Um, and it's just like it, it the, the the one I saw today was a lady with like extremely long fingernails, like two and a half inch fingernails, holding this tiny little handheld device talking about Pokemon or talking about Game Boy Advance games or or whatever. And and you know, it's it's a lot of um and they'll have like some more in the background uh rotating on little QVC. And so it's turned like TikTok into public access QVC. It's like this super trashy, like people went out and bought the spinny display and set the thing on it. So it looks legit or whatever. And you just see a button at the bottom of the screen. This is like, you could buy this thing for $14. And, uh, you know, with your, your new customer discount, please, please become a new customer. Please. If you buy one thing, we're convinced you'll do it again. So we'll give you an insane deal on the first one. And so you find all these live streams of like, it's just fucking people. It's not like people at like TikTok headquarters. It's not fucking David from QVC coming on and going, all right, we're going to do our happy dance and it's time for more kitchen shit. Uh, it's just like some lady playing Mario 64 on a device that does not have an analog stick. And also the device is not powerful enough to properly emulate N64 games. So like clearly they're overclocking aspects of it and it runs all fucking weird and the music is higher pitched and the whole thing is garbage. And she's like just running around jumping like really poorly. You're like, my Mario 64, it plays this. Yes. And, and you're like, what am I watching? I just want to see the lady shake it. Um, and like every third thing. And, and so it's not always live streams. All the live streams I'm getting are, are, are almost always those emulator devices. Um, but then like every third video is someone going like, I bought this thing. It's great. And it's just like someone making a fucking video, but they're talking about an item that they bought, but it's also like something that they're getting commissions on when it sells. And so of course they're like, this is a great bottle opener. This is the best screwdriver I've ever used. You've got it. You've got to get, the, you know, you got to check out this screwdriver and it's them unscrewing stuff for, you know, well, pennies on the dollar that they get as a commission or whatever the fuck. And it, it, the whole thing just has this vibe of, it's like a real, like this should just be season three of the Max Hedrum show. Like network 23, Edison Carter has got to get to the bottom of citizen fucking home shopping networks and who is holding a gun to their head. It's like the magic and the uh, audacity and the weirdness and the, the weird personalness of like cam girl sites, but instead they're selling you tiny emulators that play GBA games. Maybe okay, maybe not. I can't tell. It's fucking weird. The world is going to end, right? This has to be the, this has to be it, right? This is like the, we went from the people streaming themselves asleep on TikTok where you can pay money to make noise in the room and then they pretend to be really agitated by it. Uh, and then we went to the AI people that like every time someone spends some money on an emote, they do the same thing over and over again. Go, oh, I love a glizzy. Oh, I love a glizzy. Oh, I love a glizzy over and over again. And now they just cut out all pretense of just like, oh, well, if you, if you, if your videos do really well, we'll pay you. So now it's just like, no, get out there and fucking work. Sell something. Sell something, man. 
Johnny Bite Dance needs his money. Uh, Bite Dance is getting out of games, I guess. They are reorging in a way that, um, I, which is weird because I think they own the company that published Marvel Snap, which is intensely popular. Uh, so I, I think I don't know that there's I don't know that they've come out and said what that means for the future of that game just yet, but it sounds like they're looking to get out of that. But uh, truly, some end of the world type stuff happening out there, and I. I think you should see it. I like TikTok a lot less than I did, say, six months ago. Um, because it's not showing me the ladies shaking it the way I want to. Now, um, Facebook, actually, weirdly enough, is is actually delivering on that front. Like, you open up the Facebook app, and they're so desperately trying to push Instagram reels or whatever on, on like, like their TikTok ripoff on Facebook. That like you scroll past like nine different suggested for you pages. We think you might like to look at these NBA memes. I'm like Facebook. It's it's like, good because that means Facebook has no the fucking idea who I am. If you think I want to see fucking NBA memes, you don't know who the fuck I am. Um, and then in there is just like look at these recent reels, and it's two things. Um, math problems. I'm sorry, three things: math problems, matchstick puzzles. Like straight up Professor Layton style. And uh, girls shaking it. That's it. And the math problems are always like super basic, like order of operation questions of just like, do you know if you need to add before you multiply or multiply before you add? Because 98% of people get this wrong. Oh! Uh, and, and I think the idea is that you would stare at that thing long enough for them to get paid. I, I like it's just the attention economy is such a fucking horrific scam. It's, it's got to be the end, right? It's got like this all has to. Uh, I don't know. I don't want it to end, but I also like I, I can't, it's 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 hard to imagine. Well, I don't know when when you've got a government creating like ads for the war they're waging maybe this all just fits into that. That just takes it in like a weird metal gear like direction. Like I was, you know, talking about max headroom, but like once, once we've crossed into that territory, um, <sighs> Jesus. Uh, anyway, so that's how my week's been going. <laughs> the steam deck OLED is fantabulous. Um, it's an amazing device. I, I am, I'm really stoked on it. I, I have been, and I still am. Um, this refresh is really sweet. I don't think it's a must own. Like I, I will say like, if you bought a steam deck and you're happy with it, like it, you know, don't feel you're, you know, you're like, I've got to get 700, you know, or like it's, it's a lot of money. Right. Um, the, the original steam deck and then the, the original steam deck, they are, they're blowing those out as well. So, you know, there's a, a lot of um, opportunities to get in on this whole portable Steam Deck thing. Uh, it's, it's, there's never been a better time to get into Linux. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about bash prompts. Let's talk about SSHing into your Steam Deck and how good it feels every time you do it. Oh, oh. Um... It's fun, man. It's a fun little thing. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm using it a little less because my son used to sleep down here uh, all night, and now he sleeps upstairs. And I bring him down, um, and I, I bring him down in the morning, and he hangs out in here for a little while. But, uh, but I got the OLED and started, you know, getting everything on it and going back to playing more games in bed, especially because I've been sick. I'm just like, I should fucking lay down, and. uh and so I've been been playing a lot more. Um, I, it's it's mostly a lot of emulation stuff, honestly, which is again maybe overkill. Maybe if I spent the fourteen dollars on the, the the three inch fingernail ladies little fake Game Boy thing that plays Mario sixty four so poorly, you know, maybe that would suffice. But um, but I love the screen on that thing. I love the way it feels. I love that I can go from you know emulating. PlayStation games or PlayStation 3 games I love that I can go from like let's play some Afterburner Climax 
to then let's play Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 plus 2. And then, you know, hey, let's go play a little, just, I don't know, let's play a little bit of Mortal Kombat 1. Does it run perfectly? No. MK1 is a little, little dicey on there. Um, but it runs well enough for you to get in there and just do some stuff. Like, I wouldn't play ranked games. Um, I would not play ranked matches on a Steam Deck. Uh, of anything, really, uh, personally. But I think the controls feel good, but it's not... Well, I mean, whatever. It's got a USB port on it. You could hook a fight stick up to it if you wanted to get weird. I know that Valve was doing that when they were showing off the original Steam Deck. Um, that's not a life I want to lead, but um, you super, you totally can. I should see how easy or possible it is to just set up Fightcade on it. That might be neat for playing, uh, for emulating some some online stuff. But, uh, but yeah, the the breadth of, I mean, you know, hey, it's a, it's a computer. It's a PC, right? I mean, I was going to say the breadth of, like, things you can play on it from generations of emulation all the way forward to, you know, a lot of current games. We'll see how long that lasts, right? I mean, games are obviously becoming uh, more and more demanding over time. Um, I have not seen Starfield running on it. I, I heard it was mostly okay. I've heard Alan Wake 2. Uh, I, th I thought I heard Alan Wake 2 ran okay on it, but I haven't really... You know, I, I have not gone back and installed the Epic Store and or Lutris or, you know, the any of the other super weird stuff. I just went through and, and did all the emulation, um, emulation stuff and, and got all that up and running. Um, but yeah, I, I just, uh, it's, it's a fantastic little device. It's, um, it's a nice thing to just kind of have, like, let's say you got to escape with your sick son and you got to go somewhere. I'm like, well, I've got this old ass laptop, which I was originally going to run this podcast from that, I was trying to set that up. I was like, okay, well, if I run this in 360p, the bottleneck was actually the shitty old laptop. I, you know, and, uh, and it got me thinking maybe I do. I was going to wait. I know I need to get a laptop because eventually I will get back out on the road and start attending events. And, you know, like someone was just asking me about PAX East, um, the other day, which is coming up kind of fast. And I need to make a decision on that, on that, I suppose. Um, and, uh, I need to think about that actually. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that question is, but eventually, you know, I, I'm going to get back out there and start seeing games and doing stuff and talking to people and blah, 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 blah. And I will need to have a new laptop to bring on the road. This one that I have that I, you know, is, is old enough to when I worked in an office and, and bringing it having it be like my emergency, like I've got to get out of here and I've got to go try to do a podcast made it whoop, like painfully clear that this laptop is not up to the task. So if anything, this it's, this is me talking myself into it being a business expense, which it is, of course. I mean, that's the only time I would use it. I don't need a, a MacBook uh, for anything else other than that. But it's like, I don't want to get it and then just have it sit for years, you know? Um, Anyone takes says, I hope the Steam Deck 2 has higher quality buttons and triggers. They're not great as is. Yeah, I I agree. I think that the the, the D-pad could be a little cooler. It's fine, but it could be it could be better. Uh the the face buttons could be a little bit better, I think, as well. Um and I I think the analog sticks on them are pretty good. You know, they could I I don't think I don't think they're Hall Effect sticks in the new model. I don't think they went through those. Um I don't think they went up and and did all of that, but uh but they should. I don't know. Um Yeah, there's there's definitely room for improvement on the controls. Absolutely. Just the quality of the of the buttons and D-pad and so on and so forth. So yeah, I, I, I agree. I would also hope that they um, make some improvements there when they when they do a full rev of the, of the Steam Deck. They did change some of the surfaces on the analog sticks for this refresh, and uh, they feel fine. I don't know. I could. I'm not sure that I would say that they are definitely better. Uh, they might just be different, but they don't feel worse. So. 
you know, there's that. Um, what else is going on? So yeah, I've been kind of on this being sick grind for a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> and you can tell I'm sick. No, you, you can, you can tell it's an off year for call of duty. By the way, I installed like five call of duty games last week. Um, Turned on the PlayStation 5 and I was like, oh, right. I guess this just plays PS4 games. I guess that means it has access to a, like, a lot of Call of Duty games. And so I reinstalled Black Ops 3, Black Ops 4, Infinite Warfare, Modern Warfare Remastered, and I guess Advanced Warfare? Um... I've, I played a little bit of the Modern Warfare Remastered, which is, you know, Call of Duty 4, back out again. Uh, they it, had, it has multiplayer. It has the stuff that you want. Um, but also they added a, a bunch of seasons. Like, there was, I totally forgot, and this is, like, part of why the, the problem with, like, a Black Ops 4. Call of Duty had a whole era there where they were selling map packs but also selling crates, like loot crates, like, you know, of just, of, or, or like, you can earn enough depot credits to open a loot crate, or you can get a dupe protected loot crate for this. And, and there were a lot of weird ways to earn them in game, but then you could also just buy a bunch of credits and do the, you know, like, and it was this insane, filthy process of like all these fucking garbage cosmetics also this is just like i i because when i logged into black ops 4 they must have just like given these out over the years or something They're like you've got 10 crates and i'm like oh let's open these and it's like oh here's face paint for a character you don't use I'm like great cool here's un more face paint for another character you don't use I'm like awesome it's fantastic here's a skin for a gun you'll never use thank you great awesome terrific we're having a great time. Um, and they, they had that whole era where they were doing like the kind of the, the overwatch thing. Um, and it's ridiculous. Um, anyway, p playing modern warfare remastered was really funny, uh, because the only people left playing it are murderers. So it's this situation where I go like, oh yeah, this is a great map. I love this map. I love to go here and shoot guys here and do this and do this. But I couldn't get anything done because I was just getting smoked over and over and over again. Like people who were like, I'm level 1200. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. I'm level 14. I haven't even unlocked everything yet. Uh, sorry, I'm drinking a milkshake. Um any water left in this that'd be nice no of course not that would be uh too helpful to me a person who could use some water right about now um <coughs> i may have to get up and get some water um I think if you're looking for, uh, someone in chat said that, uh, yeah, uh, and what's next again, is I crave something new in a Call of Duty form factor, but I refuse to pay $70 to be directly insulted by this year's game. You should install Combat Master Season 1 on Steam. That's the, that's the full name of that, right? If you like fun and games that are kind of trashy, you may remember uh, a little game called Combat Master that I streamed uh, back when it first came out. Me and Pat Bear hanging out. Um, I have uh, I have since gone back to Combat Master a handful of times. It is free. Um, and it's this very slippery, loose, fucking weird first person shooter that is. They made it in a very Call of Duty like uh, style. It's janky. I think half the players you play against are on mobile, which makes them very fun to kill. Um, and yeah, I, I, rec I recommend it. I recommend it. 
Uh, it also runs quite well on a Steam Deck, speaking of which. So, uh, yeah. Activated Complex says, my numero uno first-person shooter that I'd be playing if I had time is BattleBit Remastered. I've had BattleBit installed for a long time and, and haven't had haven't had much time to spend on it. It looks fantastic. I don't know that it'll necessarily be my kind of shooter from looking at, you know, kind of what it is and stuff, but I, I, I do need to try that out. Um... Anyway, yes, Combat Master Season One on Steam. I, 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 I recommend it. I, I really, I really do recommend it. It's, it's janky, but it's, it's super fun for like an hour. <laughs> so for the price, uh, it's, it's fantastic. Um. All right, look, why don't we get into the news? I'm going to push this button over here. We'll get into the news. Yo, Dragon's Dogma 2 is coming out in March. The date leaked. They made it official today, March 22nd. Um, they also had a showcase showing part of the game, and I have not had time to watch that yet. Um Dragon's Dogma is a tale of the Arisen whose heart is taken by the dragon. While the sequel mirrors the world setting of the first game, the adventure takes place in a parallel world. Of course it does. Of course it does. Um, <laughs> that's soon. Do you think it will say? Do you think that it will say anything about human bones moving on their own? Do you think that they're gonna go? I guess I haven't. I need. I should watch the footage. Um. Yeah, I should, I should take a look at the footage and see if it looks like it'll be that type of janky or if they've smoothed that out. Um, Capcom's localization team just started like a Twitter account or something. Um, we should go ask them if, if it will, if, if, if Dragon's Dogma 2 will cover that specific nuance of skeleton lore. Um, oh, let's see. According to gamesindustry.biz, who would know? Gamesindustry.biz is up for sale. Uh, along with Eurogamer, uh, VG247, Rock Paper Shotgun, and more. These are all owned by Reed Pop, who is the events company that runs EGX over in uh, the United Kingdom, as well as uh, they run PAX. Reed Pop was a company who was set to run um, E3. Digital, Digital Foundry is part of that group, but my understanding, well, I, I don't know. From the way this is written, it says here, the business also holds shares in outside Xbox, Digital Foundry, and Hookshot. So if they only hold shares in Digital Foundry, I'm guessing that means that the... Because they have a separate subscription thing for Digital Foundry, right? I'm guessing that means that they were able to negotiate something with the parent company to say, hey, we're going to leave unless you want to let us do our own thing and own part of it. And they said, okay, that, that's, I'm, that's... I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm guessing that that's what that is. But Digital Foundry has a Patreon, so... It would be weird for a thing wholly owned, you know, like these other read pop companies to be on Patreon, I think. But um, maybe that's not that weird. Anyway, read, read pop uh, buy all this stuff in 2028. Uh, they bought all this stuff in 2018. Uh, and then COVID happened. And the events business took a big shit, obviously. And so Reed Pop is probably not doing nearly as well as they were on the other side of, of that. Um, and so according to gamesindustry.biz, the company said in a statement, Reed Pop, part of RX, has reviewed its UK business and decided to investigate the potential sale of its gamer network and associated editorial digital properties. We believe that no new ownership, we believe that new ownership offers the best conditions for the growth of the business. This does not impact any of the other read pop properties in the UK, including MCM, Comic-Con, EGX, and Popverse. Okay. 
Um, I don't know what Hookshot is. Is Hookshot a digital advertising business? Uh, for some reason, I think that's what it is, but I could be wrong. I'm thinking of Hammer Suit. Close enough. Um, I don't know who... <sighs> I don't know who buy like in the, in this climate with where things are right now. I don't know who goes and buys these websites. Um, if these sites were doing great, making money, all this other stuff, then Reed would probably keep them because you know this. So you have to assume that, you know, maybe these are break-even businesses at best. I don't know. Maybe they're, they're eking out a small profit. Is it, uh, um, is it, Hey, they're going to try and sell it all first. And then if that doesn't work, they're going to start laying people off and shutting down brands. I mean, you know, they already did shut down us gamer. If you remember that was, uh, well, I guess that was before read pop bought it, right? No, us gamer shut down in. After the read pop acquisition, right? Uh, I don't have a good answer to that question. Okay, 2020 is when the remaining US gamer staff was laid off. Okay. Um, so, there's a Wikipedia page for Gamer Network. Um, gamer network, meaning Euro gamer, you know, originally it was Euro gamer and it was a family business. And then they started us gamer, uh, American gamers. Um, us gamer launched in 2013 and made it until 2020. But, uh, yeah, uh, read pop picked it up in, in 2018. Um, and I'm trying to see if the, the executives, the founders, uh, stayed on and if they're still at Reed or, yeah, it looks like, looks like that's the case. Okay. So hookshot is, that's okay. That's even weirder. Because another layer to this, where they mention Hookshot in the in the article about what they're looking to sell off, and Hookshot publishes Nintendo Life, Push Square, Pure Xbox, and Time Extension sixty four. So I guess that's like four more websites uh, involved in that. And the founder of Eurogamer, I guess, is the chairman of Hookshot Media and the founder and CEO of some community platform. I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's, let's not sit here and try to untangle the weird ownership mess of, of that stuff. I, I, this is a hard one, right? Um, cause they're going to put it up for sale and who's going to buy it and how much are they going to get? I will tell you, at some point before the pandemic, I got a random email from someone saying, Hey, do you want to buy a popular video game website? If you agree to this and, and you know, we'll send you the, the, the PDF on it or whatever. Uh, and it was push square and they wanted way too much fucking money for it. Um, And, um, yeah, I don't know. Like at one point years, years, years ago, like not long after I, I found myself working for CBS. So sometime after 2012, someone came to me and, and said, uh, Hey, we're thinking of buying rock, paper, shotgun. What do you think? I said, sure. And that didn't, that didn't come together. Um, for, for whatever reason, um, 
But like the who's left that's out there buying video game websites and saying, yeah, Atari, right? It's Atari. <laughs> it's like this it's fucked up. It's like who's got who's going to come out there and buy this shit? Atari is going to save these websites. It's not going to be like who's a you know, what publishing organization is going to be like, yes, it's time to get deeper into web publishing. Video game content is uh, the advertising market is so good right now. We need more traffic. We just need more page views to put these damn ads on and then we'll all be billionaires. Like it, it's just, yeah, it's, um, it's really fucked up out there. Um, so I, I just don't know, you know, you end up in situations where you're like, you know, is a company like fandom just trying to pump up their brand portfolio in a way that makes them look bigger uh, for when they decide to try to sell to someone, maybe they would be interested. I don't know what their portfolio looks. I don't know what their their balance sheet or whatever. I don't know what, if they would even have the money to do something like that. Um, but I have no idea who would. Um, I, I just I just don't know who would pick these up. And that's the scary part is I just feel like there are not like, like all of the companies that would be likely buyers for stuff like this have already kind of gone through the ringer of buying something like this and then selling it off or shutting it down or whatever. Like, you know, it was, it was the, the escapist stuff last week, you know, they, that was a company that bought the escapist from another company that bought it from someone else. You know, the escapist had changed hands a handful of times already. And, um, you know, like who owns Destructoid now? Is it was it the same company that owns the Escapist, or did they separate in the last acquisition? I'm not sure. I know they were they were part of the same thing for a while. So it's just everything's such such a mess right now, and it, you just don't get the impression that the money is there. And so I, I like this feels bad. I think GamesIndustry.biz is is like a a really useful. Uh, a really useful website. I think that they their coverage feels a lot different than most of the other outlets out there. I think this, the work that like a Brendan Sinclair does, for example, I think he is holding, he's taking the industry to task in a way that no one else does. And I think that what he is writing is vital and interesting. I think the rest of the publication is doing nice work as well. Um, but I think Brendan is doing something that doesn't happen at most other outlets. Um, and so that's all very frustrating. I think, um, I mean, there's, there's good stuff, you know, there's good stuff up and down that thing. Well, like, you know, what video games chronicles is technically part of, I, you know, I don't think they're, they're not owned, but like they're, uh, they have a big read pop banner on the bottom of their page linking to all of these other sites, some of which don't even exist anymore. Um, but I think that maybe they just, maybe if I'm, I'm again, I'm just guessing, uh, that read pop sells ads for video games, Chronicle or something like that. Maybe it's a relationship like that. I I'm again, just guessing like a network deal. Um, how would I contrast Brendan Sinclair from Jason Schreier? Uh, they're doing very, very different work. Like Brendan is not necess not out there in like the scoops game. Like he's not out there getting emails from people and chasing down like those types of sources. He is reporting on the business end of the industry, which, you know, Jason does some of that as well. I mean, it's Bloomberg, right? So that's a big part of what they do. Um, but uh, they are extremely different styles of reporting. Um for sure um yeah it's uh wh whatever you don't need me to like get up here again you know every single week and say it's still bad out there but uh here's an that's another that's another case of hey it's, it's still bad out there um and we will see who ends up picking this stuff up? I, I again, I, I just don't know. There's the, there's someone out there, right? I mean, you know, and, and again, I think that there is there's a path through this. I do believe that, and not just because I have to believe that in order to like 
go on. But I really truly believe that there is a path through this. It will get worse before it gets better, but I do think on the other side of this that people will continue to find out, figure out different ways to publish things online and different ways to run a business online and a publishing business online specifically uh, to make these things work. Right now they don't. The ad market is super upside down. Social media, you know, because the, the thing that a lot of, I mean, there's a number of things, right? But just as another example, video game websites would run into this problem or eventually ran, started running into this problem um, where people with ad money to spend would look at the market and go, where can I spend, where should I spend this money for maximum impact? And they would go, oh, well, I could buy the front page of GameSpot for this amount of money and whatever this, and I'll get JC Hayes on the phone. I'll talk to her and I'll, I'll buy their homepage for the week of E3 or, or whatever. Um, but over time, all those buyers started looking at just like, well, wh what's the eyeballs in the demographic I'm looking for and where are those eyeballs? And they would look around and go, oh, Facebook, which at the time they were, you know, Facebook, we don't think of it that way anymore. Demographically, we think of it as an older crowd or whatever, but, um, instead they could go just spend all that ad money on Facebook or other similar social media networks. Um, and so it, it became like, why would I, okay, especially if you're a gaming product, you start to go through this process. If you're an ad buyer of like, why would I go to a gaming website? That's going to report on my game. Anyway, the people reading this website are still, are, they already know that my game exists. They already know when it's coming out. I don't need to put more ads in front of them. They already fucking know. Instead, I'll go to Facebook and spend a bunch of random money on people in my target demographic and expose new people to the game. Now, now, mind you, years later, once all the numbers got picked apart and once Facebook went, whoops, uh, they realized that it was all a fucking house of cards and that the whole thing was built on something between uh, an oversight and a full-on scam, let's say, somewhere in the middle there. Um... And so you ended up in a situation where it's like, okay, all these publishing websites, not just video games, but you know, all sorts of publishing online got completely fucked over. Uh, if it's not Google, it's Facebook. If it's not Facebook, it's, you know, whatever other social media network that is running ads. Um, and so you end up in this situation where it's like, okay, all the money drained away from these sites. And now, now what? Now you've proven that the place you were spending that money didn't work used to have a pretty good thing going, buying ads on video game websites. It seemed like they at least paid off. You at least seemed like you at least got it in front of people that were potential buyers of your game. But I don't think they're going back to that because I don't think anyone's going back to that because I think everyone kind of woke up one morning and said, advertising on the internet. <laughs> Pish posh. Um, or not. I mean, you know, there's still plenty of ads on the internet, right? It's not like they went away. But... um. And so that's why all the ads got more nefarious, right? You've got brand influencers doing sponsored streams. You've got this and that, you know, that's, it's integrated. It's, uh, integrated into the content, uh, that happened on television that happened on, you know, like all, all that sort of stuff. Um, Conan O'Brien with cars or whatever. Right. And before too long, it's just going to be some lady with three inch fingernails, just tapping a screen on a thing and going like, this game's coming out next week. You really need to buy it on TikTok, Right. Um, I think all of this stuff has to shake out and I think that everyone has to kind of work together to figure out a new way forward. Um, but right now I think we've got a lot of people in, in this space who are convinced that like, Oh, well we'll just do it with AI. Oh, we'll just do it with this. We'll just do it with that. Like they still think that there's some shortcut to having content that people actually want to see. And I agree in the short term that there is, there are plenty of shortcuts. Um, but over time, that AI content's not going to win out. Um, over time, the hyper SEO focused articles can't last forever. Um, because I think you're going to have people that have real needs and real desires that want to see real shit. Um, 
you will still have plenty of people that are just like vapidly looking at the internet and you know clicking on whatever is first or you know that that'll that, i don't think that'll ever fully go away but i do think that you will you will see you will eventually see a rise of people who are just like this is fucked I want to see, I'm actually looking for something to, you know, to be legit entertained or informed or whatever. Like, not just, you know, this eight-second blip vert of a lady selling me Mario 64 over again. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, right now, I think, you know, we're like, like we saw with the Escapist team starting their, their new thing. Like we saw with Aftermath launching... Of course, you know, remap radio and, and, and that sort of thing, you know, that we see people going into these kind of independent silos and running it themselves. And I think right now that's that's the right answer. Um But the reason, you know, and 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 I think Aftermath is doing a good job of of being something similar to this, but people are always like, Where's the defector? Where's the defector media of video games? Where is that? Where, where, why doesn't, why doesn't someone do that? Um, and I think that, you know, like places like Remap, like they're doing things similar to that. Um, you know, and people have asked me, why don't you go start the defector of, you know, or why aren't you and the, these people doing this and start the defector of video games? And the answer is because if you want to paywall video, you have to host it somewhere and that's fucking expensive. Like you can go look at defectors books because they publish their, uh, they publish their financials and, and I have done that on multiple occasions, but I also know how much it costs to host high quality for res video of gameplay of video games and long podcasts and all of that bandwidth stuff kills you. So if you're if you're running a text organization and some podcasts and stuff like obviously you know you can you can host a podcast anywhere but if you want to host it behind a paywall that starts to get slightly trickier but there are plenty of options for that as well. But once you start to get into high quality high res video that you want to put behind a paywall, no one's really doing that. Patreon isn't. You know, I, I can post I can post videos to page to Patreon for patrons, um, and I've been able to do that as kind of a, like a freebie for a while. But that's a beta of a product that they're going to sell to creators. That's something that they're eventually going to go. Oh, if you want this much storage space for video, then you need to pay us this percentage of this, and you know, so they're gonna even them. And and I don't think their video player is awesome. It's um. It's not a great place to watch long videos, you know? Like, I don't think their video viewing experience is, is great. Um, so, like, the defector model, I think, yeah, if you're, if you're talking low bandwidth, relatively low cost of storage of, you know, images and podcasts and, and that sort of stuff, I think that's totally fine. If you're, like, throwing up somewhere between, let's say, 9 and 15 hours of high-res, 60 frames per second, good bitrate video... Oh, every single week. Um, that's just not there yet. Um, and if there's, hey, if you run some service out there and you, if you're watching this and going like, no, it's totally there. We do that. We don't, we don't, we do, why don't we do that? Hit me up. Um, but in my experience and my travels, I have not found a, 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 a reasonable way to, to do that. Um, and with video games, I, you know, there's a desire to see the video games in motion and uh, a desire to do good, fun, premium paywalled video series and all that sort of stuff. And so... So yeah, you can do unlisted YouTube links and you know, that's, you're still kind of at the mercy of YouTube. I have done that as well. Um, I've, instead of using, cause you know, I have a limited number of hours on Patreon. So, but if a, but an unlisted YouTube link is free. So it's, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's weird. I know a lot, a lot of people on Patreon do the, the unlisted YouTube link. Cause at the end of the day, 
And this is something that when I was running a site with a full-on paywall, we saw a lot of piracy. Um, and, uh, you know, I was always like, whatever about it. Like within reason, you know, it's just like, you want to like, oh, can we close these holes that make it like painfully easy to just download these videos? Because if it's people downloading it from us, then we have to pay the bandwidth cost. So if they're, if they're pirate, if they're, if they're downloading the videos without paying us for a subscription, whatever, if they're downloading them from us, then it's, it's additional cost. And then someone eventually comes to me and goes, your bandwidth costs sure are expensive. And I have to go, well, fucking, I don't know, fix the thing. I'm not an engineer. I, you know, like and the engineering team did a wonderful job multiple times fixing stuff. To the point where there was just like some guys passing a spreadsheet around um, of, I think there were a lot of them were eventually external links, which you can't stop. You know, you can, right? I mean, you can go like, oh, we're going to quash all these unlisted YouTube links of people uploading our stuff other places and, and whatever else. And, and I, you know, I think I've said this before, but uh, Matt Rory had access to that spreadsheet every single time. Every single time it changed, every single time they went, oh, all these got shut down. How'd that happen? Like, cause we fucking had access to it the entire time, the entire time. Um, but, uh, you know, you want to stop it with, you want to stop it in a way that like, okay, this is costing us additional money that you, that you, that you would, you would like to stop. Um, but people eventually, like, there was a, you know, one one series of videos we did. People actually did scene releases for them. They wrote info files, and they fucking po posted them around on sites and stuff. And I looked at that and went like, huh. And I felt like we made it. <laughs> when I saw that, when I saw an info file for a video that I was in, I was like, man, shit. Nice. Um, we're, it's, we're zero day, man chunk up these fucking raw files into 25 fucking uh, anyway I, I don't know so yeah I guess my, that's my long winded way of saying I don't know where this stuff goes just yet um, because I think there's just there are some questions that are a little too hard to answer on the, the bandwidth front and, and all of all of that stuff Rory uh, Pac Mantis says, uh, Rory sure wore a lot of hats on that site. Customer service, piracy stopper, a guy on a couch. Matt Rory held that whole thing together. That thing would have spun apart multiple times without Matt Rory there. Um, Matt Rory was the guy, all the t-shirt stuff. Everything went through him like that, that, that dude, you talk about like unsung heroes of things like, man, man. Um, yeah, he, he he did a whole lot of stuff. Um, and I think he's probably doing a whole lot of stuff at his new thing. He's he's a, one of the most capable people I've ever met. I would uh I would work with Matt Rorty again in a heartbeat. In fact, I uh at one point was talking about taking him somewhere if I could. I didn't tell him that until after the fact, but anyway. Um Let's see what else is going on. Uh, Bungie finally confirmed that they are indeed delaying the next, uh, the the final shape, the next big expansion for Destiny Two. It will be out on June fourth. This was widely um, reported back when the layoffs happened, but they did not announce it until yesterday. Um. They have a very uh, a pretty short message here. The final shape is the culmination of the first 10 years of Destiny storytelling, and for Guardians everywhere, countless hours spent together. We want to honor that journey, so we're taking the time we need to deliver an even bigger and bolder vision, one that we hope will be remembered and treasured for years to come. Uh, Season of the Wish begins tomorrow and will extend until the launch of the final shape in June. Team is adding new content available for all players to jump into until the launch of the final shape. So even though they're extending the season, they are attempting to put new things into that season so it's not just the same stuff. Um uh, 
yeah okay i mean yeah obviously they went through some layoffs and you know they they need to get this right i saw some um some additional complaints now that i have steam launched over here i can look this up real quick someone said that they were selling a 15 dollar starter kit yeah destiny 2 starter pack that was like completely useless but let's see what this says Includes a supercharged arsenal for Guardians to begin their adventure. Uh, three exotic weapons. Traveler's Chosen, Ruinous Effigy, and Sleeper, Stim uh, Sleeper Simulant. 125,000 Glimmer, 50 Enhancement Cores, 5 Enhancement Prisms, and 1 Coveted Ascendant Shard. If you're just starting to play that Destiny 2, you don't know what any of that fucking shit is. That sound, yeah, that seems silly. As a thing to sell, like, hey man, are you just getting into Destiny 2? Because the answer is no. People are not just getting into Destiny 2. The numbers are down. I don't think I don't think that <clears throat> a $15 pack of some currencies. I, yeah, I, I'm I'm not even sure what most of those currencies do. Season of the Wish Silver Bundle comes with an emote the brave explorer legendary emote all right well i don't know destiny 2 i reinstalled it but have not had time to launch it i do kind of want to see where it's at these days because I, I fell off pretty hard seemingly everyone else did too um interesting that I, I felt like i was alone in that but i guess not i guess i was very much uh at the forefront of not playing Destiny 2, I suppose. Um, I had a lot of fun with that game for a good long time. I, I, I want to check in on it. I want to believe it's going to like get back together and be like amazing, but I, I don't... I don't know. Jeff Keighley did a live stream doing some uh, some Q&As. I'm getting more and more stuffed up here. I can I can mute myself. I can mute myself and and uh, and sniffle a bunch. It's not helping though. Um Anyway, the, the a few uh, Kotaku picked this up. A few other uh, outlets did as well. Uh, Jeff Keighley took some questions from chat about the game awards and nominees and what the ceremony is going to be and like, oh, hey, uh, you know, he's ramping up security to try to keep people from storming the stage. Good. And also uh, someone finally asked him like, hey, why is Dave the Diver in the best independent games category when it's, you know, you know, made by what Nexon or, or whoever it was? Um Mint Rocket is a team that is owned. Uh, they're part of Nexon. Um, he said pretty much exactly what I thought he would. Uh, as as someone who has been a a judge for the Game Awards for a very long time, this is something that kind of um a a, a, a like a jury guide is sent out ahead of time to try to explain like oh here's how you should you know here, here's sort of how we view these categories and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's up to the judges. Um, and so in this case, enough judges said, Dave the Diver, that's one of the best indie games that came out this year. And they wrote it on the form. And thus it's a nominee. Um, would it be weirder? And I, so I don't know what people would want him to do in this situation. Uh, you know, I, I, I think there could be a firmer hand on... Not to rehash the entire genre discussion that we just had a couple of weeks ago, but, um, you know, when they do awards for action game and they do awards for action adventure and all this other stuff, like I often look at it and go like this, this is such a weird, a weird split. And it's not, not always easy to know what goes where because, um, because I'm right about genres and a lot of other people are wrong, quite frankly, uh, <laughs> But the best independent game, well, whatever. I mean, you know, the what is indie discussion happened all through music and all this other stuff, you know, that's, it's, it's whatever, right? Um, but, uh, 
but like, oh, you know, what do you? Dave the Diver being basically made by Nexon to me says, ah, it's not, that's not, that's not an independent game. Uh, so I did not even consider it for that category because I knew it was owned by Nexon. One would then assume that a lot of judges either did not know that fact, which, you know, they don't go out of their way to tout it as far as I can tell. Uh, it's been a while since I played it, but uh, they did not know or they did not care. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I think that that's a... a I think on one hand, I think that's, that's probably the right way to handle it where you're like, okay, um, we're just going to, whatever the judges put in the form is what we're putting on there. And, and so a lot of the stuff, you know, when, when they talk about like best community support or best ongoing game, like best ongoing game is one of the, the interesting ones because, um, or even, you know, like even best overall game, like I, the, because games get DLC, you, you saw, um, cyberpunk the DLC getting, um, nominated for some stuff. And I kind of look at that and go like, well, yeah, but the cyberpunk came out years ago and it's kind of, you know, like, yeah, there's new content for it, but is that enough to do this? Then? And so I think even that's a little wishy washy of considering that a 2023 release, uh, unless you're going to do a separate category for add on content, um, or like best ongoing game, best ongoing game is a great category for that, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, like, you know, the, the, would the awards be better if the people running the awards show put a very firm hand on the genre discussion? Cause I don't think they would get a 100% right either. Um, <clears throat> um, and so that just becomes like, oh, now everyone's getting mad at someone else, but someone's still mad because you can't have a genre discussion without someone getting mad. And um, yeah, so I, I don't, I don't really think that that solves that problem. Uh, Keeley brought up Baldur's Gate three and Death Stranding. I was like, are those games indie games? Because you know, hey, Death Stranding was funded by Sony. You know they. They put money into getting that game made for sure. Baldur's Gate three. That's probably, well, I mean, who were the investors in, you know, who owns Larian? Does Larian own Larian or, you know, does Tencent own 40% of Larian? You know, Epic was a company that like for a while you go like, well, I guess Epic's technically an independent company. And then Tencent invested, invested a bunch of money. And you're like, well, I guess not anymore. Devolver is publicly traded in the UK. Are they an independent company still? That's right, right? They, they Devolver. Uh... Yeah. 21 uh, points. On the old, uh, the old GBX, I guess. I don't know what that is. I don't know what any of this is. Um... But yeah, the whole like what is independent is Annapurna still independent, even though they published and funded so many different games. Like it's just kind of so. I I don't know the independent discussion. I think is a really tricky one, to the point where uh, it's kind of not worth having. Um, but also, I think the award itself is meaningful because you end up with a lot of games that would get overlooked otherwise. Um, to me, this is just like a new way to kind of have the, uh, best downloadable game, which is what we used to call it in the Xbox 360 days when we wanted to say like, you know, cause you didn't want to say best Xbox live arcade game because you wanted to make sure you were covering PSN. And then you get into a situation where it's like someone, someone eventually pipes up in the meeting and goes, well, you know, you can just download the World of Warcraft client, right? You don't have to buy it in a box. You can just download it. Is that best downloadable? And then you just look at them and go, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Motherfucker. We'll be here all night. 
Um, and so I look at it as you kind of just have to like put some like spirit into it and go like, what's the spirit of this game? Is this a downloadable game in spirit? Is this an independent game in spirit? Should it be the best independent spirit award? The best independent spirit award. Why not? Uh, yeah, so, you know, maybe that's something you could fix by renaming the category. Because I do think it is sensible to try to honor games of that ilk. But the terminology is just fucking weird. So, you know, I don't know how you... I don't know what the right answer is in that in that specific situation. Um, but I do think that the way that they are doing it of just like, hey, man, if the judges wrote it in there, fuck it. I, th I think that is as good an answer as any. Probably better than most answers, to be honest. Because it is the purest. You could argue that the judges should be more educated on some of that stuff. But again, maybe they knew and didn't care. I don't know. Um, speaking of the game awards, Microsoft is claiming that they will have important announcements there. This is according to video games, Chronicle, who still looks at Twitter. Um, yeah, they just, they put out a, um, they put out some promotional materials saying that they had important announcements planned for the event as well as other exciting Xbox news. Don't know. If that ends up being, uh, what does that end up being? You know, is that because they've, uh, you know, the video games Chronicle points out that they, that's right. They showed the Xbox series X there. That's right. They did. And, and they also showed Hellblade two. Um, yeah. Would this be, uh, something related to the Activision games getting on their, on their way to game pass? Would this be something, um, this could be new stuff to show on some of the announced games that they have. Um, I don't think it's new heart, you know, it could be, you know, but what if this is something of a hardware announcement of whatever, you know, cause they, they had all those big leaks about their, you know, their digital only console that they were very quick to backpedal on. Um, and so there's always the possibility that they have some new piece of hardware. They're like, well, shit, man, Sony fucking put out a smaller PlayStation five. Can we, do we got something? Can we do our updated controller? Can we maybe just announce that there? Can we do, you know, like, um, we'll see. I am still kind of on the fence about it, but with the way I, you know, well, we're talking about next week at this point, so I might have missed my window, uh, but I'm probably going to be here uh, for the Game Awards. I don't think I'm going to go. I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to make it in to town this year just with the, the baby so young and the schedule has been so weird and we've been sick for the last month and I just, I just want to fucking stay home. So perhaps we will do a stream of the game awards together TBD on that one. But that's, that's where I'm leaning right now. Um, let's see. Uh, last little bit of news here about video games. Anyway, I could talk as a story on this. I saw this a couple other places, but, uh, Bethesda has, Bethesda has started responding to Steam reviews. Um, which seems like an incredibly bad use of time. They, they have started to respond to negative Steam reviews with like the, they kind of look like form letters in a way but like they do get a little bit specific they do sign it as bethesda customer support um there's one screenshot here that says uh thank you for taking the time to provide your review and we're sorry to hear that you were disappointed with encountering many loading screens while playing while there may be loading screens in between fast traveling 
Just consider the amount of data for the expansive gameplay that is procedurally generated to load flawlessly in under three seconds. We believe that shortcoming will not hinder our players from getting lost in the world we created. And then from there, it's got a paragraph of just like, even after completing the main story, your adventure doesn't end. You can continue on to New Game Plus to keep blah, 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 blah. You can give further feedback here, and it's a Bethesda URL, as if to say like, hey, post your feedback here at a place where we can bury it, as opposed to writing it in public places where you're giving our game a mixed average on Steam. Um, there's another screenshot here. We are sorry that you do not like landing on different planets and are finding many of them empty. Some of Starfield's planets are meant to be empty by design, but that's not boring. And then in quotes, but not attributed anywhere, anywhere. When the astronauts went to the moon, there was nothing there. They certainly weren't bored, which is something Todd Howard said in like a New York Times interview or something. He gave that in, in some mainstream press interview. But like they just put it there in quotes, did not attribute it to Todd Howard. And then went on to say, the intention of Starfield's exploration is to evoke a feeling of smallness in players and make you feel overwhelmed. You can continue to explore and find worlds that do have resources you need or hidden outposts to look through. And then the same boilerplate paragraph about the game and all this other stuff. It just seems um, gross. I don't, I don't know. Needless. Here's another one. Here's another one of their posts. You can fly, you can shoot, you can mine, you can loot. Starfield is an RPG with hundreds of hours of quests to complete and characters to meet. Most quests will also vary on your character's skills and decisions, massively changing the outcome of your playthrough. Try creating different characters with backgrounds and characteristics that clash or, or, or are a positive of your previous character. You will feel like you are playing a totally different game. <laughs> no, you fucking won't. Put points in different skills from a character you've previously created and you are now faced with completely different decisions to make and difficulties to encounter. There are so many layers to Starfield that you will find things you never, you've never knew were possible after playing for hundreds of hours. Don't do this. Why would you do this? This is pathetic. Even if they are written by robots, even if this is like an AI being deployed to write this stuff, it is, um, what is the right, what is the right, like, you know, it's not, uh, the, the Korean, is that, uh, what the, the, perhaps Bethesda should just hold that L and not do this. It just seems um, desperate, desperate, sad, I suppose, um, completely bizarre. Um, and, and so, you know, the, where, where are the Starfield reviews on Steam? They are mixed, I believe. Um, I have been thinking a lot about the reception to Starfield. Um, yeah, mixed is where it currently sits. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the reception to Starfield and also the general vibes of both the coverage and a lot of the discussion around Call of Duty this year. And maybe this is a situation where when, you know, there's been so much shit shaken loose in people who write about video games and, and all of this stuff is all of, all of that stuff has been so tumultuous this year, um, mixed with consumers who are feeling the pressure of how expensive games are and, and all of this other stuff. And together, everyone has kind of just stood up and realized, like, we don't fucking have time for this shit anymore. Like, why would I, you know, like, whatever. Like, people ain't fallen for it the way they used to. I was, so I, and, and this kind of caught me off guard because, you know, when we were talking about the Game Awards um, nominees for Best Game, I remember being a little surprised that Starfield was not on the list. 
And some people were like, what, what are you talking about? That game's got... I was like, no, 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 I'm not... Nothing I'm saying has anything to do with the quality of the game. It has a lot more to do with the sorts of people who play games, cover games, nominate games. I have seen a lot of games that were worse than Starfield get nominated for even bigger reward, uh, awards over the years, is my point. Um, and so it, it's, you know, it's it was, it was crazy to me when the Starfield reviews started hitting and people were like very, I think, level-headed about it. Um, and at the time, you know, because I, I got Starfield a little later than, than a lot of the other folks, um, I was still at a point where I was really enjoying the game and it wasn't until I put another 10 hours into it or so after that, that I was like, okay, I'm, I am, uh, really not liking anything about where this is going. Last time I played that game, I finished it. I finished the main quest line and, uh, I found that entire sequence, that entire end of game thing that you do and the choice that you make and the things that happen afterwards, that whole thing was so underwhelming. It left such a disturbing, like it, just, it left such a bad taste in my mouth that I have not gone back to it since. Um, And that's not shocking or whatever. I mean, you know, I think uh, the endings of a lot of Bethesda's games have been lackluster and, you know, like, but, but at the same time, people e have eaten that shit up for decades. So I can sit here and tell you like, oh yeah, man, I don't know, man. I think, you know, Fallout 3 ending was pretty shitty and all this other stuff. People are like, how dare you say that about Fallout 3? But now even, even actually, I think the worm has turned on that. Let's, you know, if you're talking shit about New Vegas, that's where, that's where people get mad now. Um... But, um, yeah, I don't know. Like it's, uh, it's interesting to see. Like, I think the, the call of duty reviews this year are, are very fascinating. Um, and I saw some, I can't remember where I saw it, but there was some columnist out there that was writing something like these reviews are, they reviewed the game too soon. They didn't play enough of it. Um, I think actually the reviews hit later than I thought they would in some cases, but um, I, I like they didn't play enough multiplayer to truly engage, you know, and it sounded like something a developer would say. Uh, but also, those reviews come out around the same time every single year. So at least they're consistent. Uh, also, I don't think that the competitive multiplayer is so deep that you would need to get to maximum level to truly engage with it uh, the way some people, uh, you know, th th and that's happens every, that happens every year. But there's some people that are just like, oh, gee, if you only got to level 30 and, and then wrote the review, you don't even, you didn't even see the good gun. Like, that's a problem with the game. <laughs> if, if you don't get to see the good gun until level 30, that's a larger problem than you think. Um... But anyway, I, I just, it, it was fascinating to me to see Call of Duty reviews hit these kind of historic lows because that's a, a, that's a franchise that generally reviews pretty safe. Like, I feel like even, even in down years, it's still pretty good, or at least like it's split into so many pieces that you end up reluctantly saying like, yeah, I mean... If this they made a lot of bad choices, but also they introduced a battle royale mode for the first time, and it works surprisingly well. So, like this aspect of the game is the worst it's ever been, but it's got this whole brand new thing. And so, it's always been this very weird because they segment it across three different modes. That's why I say you know that it ends up reviewing pretty safe. Because there's always going to be enough variance in people's experiences. They're going to say, hey, this, you know, this campaign's trash, but 
who cares? The competitive multiplayer is better than it's ever been. Or, you know, like, like there's always going to be these weird offset things that, that end up leading to these eight-ish kind of scores, right? Um, and so it was interesting to see that trend kind of wiped away this year for, for Call of Duty. But also to see, again, you know, like the, the fervor that usually accompanies a new Bethesda release um, usually carries it. So even in a situation where it, it'll have some negative reviews, like it might still end up getting nominated for awards because people, more people on staff played it and finished it and loved it and blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why some of that stuff can happen. And so to me saying Starfield will end up on best game, that felt to like an insanely safe pick on my part when I was like, yeah, I don't know. Like even as someone who has problems with Starfield, I was like, yeah, but it'll probably still end up on that list. And it didn't. And I'm like, oh, huh. That's probably for the best. That's good. That's good. Um, and, uh, Anyway, I don't know where I'm going with that. I just, it's just, I, it, that felt very interesting to me because that's, that's not usually how this stuff goes. Um, but that's why I felt that way. You know, it wasn't about, it wasn't about me going like Starfield's one of the five best games of the year. How dare you? And it's like, no, I, I don't, I don't think that I, I don't, I'm not as down on it as a lot of other people are and you know, whatever it's, it's, there were things I liked about that game. Starfield is fine. I think the ending is bad. I think that the main storyline is bad, but that's something you could say about most of Bethesda's games, that all the interesting things are in all of the uh, separate uh, separate quest lines. Um, but yeah, very interesting to see, you know, and I don't know if that, is that a factor of it being $70? Is that a factor of uh, people being done with these games that get super hyped up? and crazy or is it just a great year for games and so when something like that comes out they're like hey, fuck this i'm gonna go back to playing resident evil 4 again and again and again or or whatever which is not a game i would have thought it would have ended up getting nominated for best game because i was like oh yeah i mean resident evil 4 had its day it got its awards then um but yeah people definitely went to bat for it and it ended up on that list so cool um, I, I don't know that I have much to say about this, but I, you know, I, I, enough people kind of mentioned it to me that I guess it's, uh, you know, kind of a little news addendum. Um, CM Punk returned to wrestling, uh, Saturday by walking out onto the stage at the very end of the show, uh, Survivor Series. Um, and then, uh, and then on Monday night's wrestling show, he came out and talked at the very end. Uh, I, uh, you know, you know, I, I, the CM Punk thing is the, the, the conversation about all of this is, is always so weirdly incendiary or whatever. I thought when he went to AEW, it was, um, potentially very exciting if he was in the right headspace and so on and so forth. Because at the end of the day, he was a guy who went out of his way over the years when he did not wrestle for, you know, eight years or however long it had been to say how he was completely done with it, how he, he lost his love for it. The, the experience he had at WWE his first time around was terrible and fuck that company and all that other shit. But also he doesn't want to do anything else anywhere either. But, you know, there was really nowhere else for him to go, especially a place that would offer him the type of money he would be looking for until AEW came along. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I thought that uh, there was a lot of potential in what uh, he could have done at AEW. I think that uh, maybe he rubbed some people the wrong way, I guess maybe is a mild way of saying that, but he got involved in a bunch of backstage fights and ended up getting fired. Um, for people who haven't heard the story, I guess he, he ended up getting fired because he, I don't know if you believe these fucking dirt sheets, he practically knocked a TV down on the owner of the company's head or something. Um, 
So point being, it was just a bunch of messy drama around that guy that, you know, even as someone who liked what he potentially had to offer, eventually it just became too much of a distraction and it took away from the things I liked about AEW. To a point where I was like, okay, yeah, they don't need to bring this. And they they brought him back again after he got in some fight and, you know, they kind of almost, they almost, it felt like they were giving him his own TV show. They they, they debuted a new Saturday TV show. And uh, and he was the big star on that one. And then the guys that he was fighting with weren't going to appear on that show from the sounds of things because they were on the Wednesday night show. And it's just like, how the fuck does this work? Well, you, know, you should probably, you should probably sit these fucking people down and fucking set them straight as an owner of the company and just be like, hey, motherfuckers. Either get along or don't, but don't fucking fight back here, you assholes. Um... So anyway, he came back again. Some other dumb shit happened. Uh, you know, he continued to rub people the wrong way. I think some of this ends up being exacerbated by some of the rumor mongering and reporting that happens in the wrestling industry. This is where it kind of parlays, where it kind of connects to video games. Because I think a lot of the rumor reporting um, in the video game industry is done with a type of reckless abandon from people who should know better. There are people out there doing that sort of work who definitely know better and they're good at it. Uh, fewer than there used to be. Uh, but there are a lot of people out there that are just like, you know, whatever they fucking hear, they're just like, I, this is happening. And they're not saying, I heard this was happening. They're saying, this is happening. When, when you're dealing in rumor and perhaps innuendo, you got to be really confident about your sources to get out there and use direct language like that. Because then when, when plans change, when anything different happens, you're left holding the bag and you look like a real dumbass. <clears throat> All you can report is what your sources tell you, but you have to decide if that's worth reporting. And if you're going to report it the exact same way that they told it to you, or if you're going to try and interpret it through like, would this person know this? So with the CM Punk stuff, <clears throat> You had a lot of reporters out there that were saying, um, oh, uh, he's, he's not coming in. I talked to a source <clears throat> and, uh, and they haven't heard of any discussions. There's, there's no discussions between WWE and CM Punk. And you kind of have to sit down and go like, okay, wait a minute. My source, does my source know this for sure? Are they at a high enough level in the organization to where they would be let in on something that would surely be kept secret from most people? Would they be privy to this information, yes or no? Um, <coughs> in this case, the answer was no, because that guy walked out on stage on Sunday night and they were like, and after the fact, they did a little press conference and you know, Triple H, who was, runs the creative end of the company, was like, oh, yeah, it all came together really quick. And I guess the fans like him. Like, he seems real noncommittal about the whole thing in a way that was just like, he gets people talking. And if the fans want it, it's. Uh, meh. <coughs> um, Sorry, my cough's getting worse. So we're going to end the show in a little bit here. Um. Anyway, CM Punk came out and, you know, he's known as someone who they, ooh, when you hand him a microphone, you never know what's going to happen. But at this point, he's been through so much legal shit and probably signed away so many NDAs and, and you know, non-disparagement clauses and, and whatever else. That you know, they're going to hand him this live mic. He ain't going to say shit. He's done saying shit about the company he used to work for, the guy he got fired from. He's not going to walk out there. and you know, So people went into this thing because wrestling fans are fucking morons. It's just how it goes, I guess. Myself included sometimes, I suppose. Um, they were like, oh, he's going to get on the microphone and tell it how it really is. Oh, yeah, I can't wait. He's going to be like, no, what? Are you children? Are you 12? Do you not understand anything about how the how business, or not even the business, but just business works? 
Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, maybe you'll get a little bit of something. It was just like, it was, it was real. So he just got on the microphone and, and, you know, after years of saying that the WWE was a shithole for shit assholes and blood money and cocks and all this, you know, it was like all this really fun stuff that he said over the years um, about how terrible that company was. He walked out there and said, I'm home. <laughs> and gave this real, like, just fucking pitch it down the middle fucking knock it out of the park real generic fucking stuff and um about he's just like oh yeah man I you know I'm back where I belong and all this other he's certainly not the first I mean he's not the first person to leave the company and then talk shit they expect it at this point when people leave WWE they expect people to then get over and get a lot of people to buy their shoot interviews on VHS or, you know, like over the years, it's always been on by, by talking shit. If you get up there and say, everyone's nice and everyone's great, then, you know, no one does the interviews. You don't, you know, you're not making a name for yourself. You're not making the next town. You're not signing to the next deal. So that type of negativity is always played well when people leave the company. Um, it's just CM Punk went and based his entire character around, being real man he's real on this microphone and all this other shit and so it just it's this sort of thing you just look at it and go like I, mm, I don't think that plays super well i don't think that uh i don't think that works super well so i, I don't know like i'm I, I i'm also i'm also not really sure that there are any or very many matches that i want to see out of him like they'll have him fight seth rollins at some point they'll have him you know, I like, you know, who's he, you know, he'll fight Cody Rhodes at some point, right? He'll fight, you know, but like, uh, looking over the WWE roster, and I think WWE, for as much as I think that Raw is a really hard show to watch, I do think they have a lot of amazing talent, and I think that, you know, when you look at where their business is at, supposedly, and, and you know, where the reporting puts their business and, and everything, like, they're out there saying like, oh man, our, uh, our business has, has rarely been better. We're selling out the towns. We're doing this. We're, you know, tickets are moving like crazy. We're doing, you know, like merchandise is amazing and so on, you know. And, and so you just look at it and go like, well, the business seems like it's going fine over there. Do you really need this fucking guy? And, you know, the answer is it could always be bigger, right? But I just don't know that, I don't know that he's a guy that long term, I, I, see a lot of upside in i don't know we'll see I, i'd love to be proven wrong you know if they can find an interesting thing for his character then that will surely work but i might argue that they are um there are a lot of people who are already at that company who could use more engaging and deeper and more interesting characters and or more interesting things to do I mean, seth rollins is holding a title belt and he it just doesn't, he's not, you know, it's like the matches are great. You know, like they're, they're, everyone can wrestle, right? It's not like, you know, I'm not sitting here going like, oh, there's bad wrestlers. They don't, they're not, their work rates. Well, you know, like they just need to be more engaging. I think that's, that's AEW's big problem. Characters. Characters need to be more welcome. They know drama, but what they really need are characters. And they're trying to do more of that while also trying to have this tournament that's all about, you know, the sports and fighting and all this other stuff. I, I don't know. Like it's, uh, AEW feels like it is slowly losing its way. Um, and, uh, and CM Punk in WWE, sure, whatever. I don't know. That's a guy that, you know, spent a good long time talking about not wanting to wrestle and, um, and people still chanted his fucking name. It was just like, why? You know, like he seems like a dick. Like, I don't know. All of my information is secondhand at best, but he never really sounded like a fun guy. Some people do seem to like him. So whatever. I don't know. Uh, anyway. Wrestling is still fucking ridiculous. And, uh, 
and I, I'm 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 kind of falling away from it a little bit, I guess I would say, which is weird because I you know I think AEW just had a pay per view that like I think ended poorly, but had some some really good matches on it. Um, but something about something about AEW feels like like it is careening off course. Like there's something happening. I don't know what it is, but just something about it doesn't feel right. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Maybe it's just too many injuries stacking up, but but I don't know. Uh, it's when you know what it's it's when you stop seeing Evil Uno on TV every single week. You know, like I I feel like that those were fantastic days. At least they've got their web series now being the dark order so we can all go check that out i suppose um yeah we'll see where it all goes i don't know it's just uh aw i feel like has gone from feeling like a real contender or a real like oh this is this thing's going to be around a long time to now i'm just like i could see this thing getting fucked up <laughs> i can see this thing getting fucked up in a bad way and, and maybe i don't know maybe we'll see it's just weird. I don't know. I, I, I like AEW. I still watch everything they put out. And I, I like a lot, I lot. A lot of the people wrestling there, I think, are doing things that I very much want to see. And that's still the case. But it's just not... There's something wrong with it. There's something off with it. I can't quite put my finger on it. But there's something... There's something about it that just doesn't feel like it lines up. There's something about it that feels like it's it's losing its its spirit. It's losing its you know. There's there's I don't know. They just need to put Willow back on TV more often. I mean the Jeff Hardy character, not Willow. No Willow Nightingale. Uh, if they did that. That fix it. Um. Anyway, that's it for the news. <laughs> um. Why don't we look and see? I did get a bunch of emails. Let's uh, let's take a look at a couple of them here. Some blue sky. Yeah, the blue sky thing. The the, the willow and blue sky and or, uh, yeah, the, uh, sorry, sky blue. Yeah, you you got it wrong too. Um. And and the the whole Julia Hart thing of like, what? like the announcers started talking about it, like, whoa, we've seen the like in a way that made it seem very dumb. Like we've seen this uh, change in attitude ever since she got the mist sprayed in her face, and you're just like, what? Well, you, know, you know, you're supposed to play dumb until a turn happens, then go what? If you're calling attention to it, it it's, it's it, I don't know, I don't know. Commentary fuck that one up. But the whole thing, I don't it seems like then they didn't go in that direction anyway. It's, it's a weird fucked up thing. Um, anyway, fucking fuck wrestling. I love wrestling, but fuck wrestling. Say the same thing about everything else. Including video games. I love video games. Sometimes, fuck video games, man. Anyway, Bill from Dubuque writes in, says the developers of Cult of the Lamb just claimed that they would add sex to the game if they hit 300,000 subscribers. That got me thinking, how does the ESRB handle post-game updates? Surely they don't check in after every patch. Is this a secret backdoor to the murder porn we've all needed in our cat and cult simulators? Has anyone been busted for this beyond the whole hot coffee thing? Um, I do think there is an ESRB process for updates, for content updates. I mean, they're not necessarily looking to patches. It's probably on you as a uh, as the developer, as the publisher, to self-submit. Because if you um, get caught out there, it's, it's, bad, it's probably bad for you. They probably do fine you for misrepresenting their ratings. Um, 
but yeah, they also, yes, they do have the, the warning on the ratings that says online interactions are not rated, but that's more focused on online interactions. Um, a lot of downloadable games, especially on PC, do not need to get rated anymore, but they, they often do. So there's, there's sort of a, a, a thing there. Um, but this was always, uh, you know, the, the, I remember with rock band lyrics that they, because the game was rated T for teen, all the DLC had to be that way as well. Cause I remember saying like, well, why don't you just sell an explicit lyrics pack? And I remember there being a very long winded answer of like, well, if we do that, then we have to actually go back and we would have to re-rate the base game up to M or, you know, some, it could be T or E10 plus, you know, it could have gone from E10 plus to T or something. I don't remember what they were rated, but because of the, but because of the lyrics, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they, they couldn't do that basically because it would, it would force them to go back and re-rate it. And this is something that, you know, when you're on console, the console manufacturers, um, police that a little more directly and care about that a little bit more than like, you know, steam does or, or whatever. Um, let's see here. Justin writes in and says, recently I spent more money than I probably should have on a working Vectrex system. And it's a neat little console to play around with. So I was just wondering if you had any experience playing a Vectrex or any other weird retro console no one talks about anymore. <clears throat> uh, yes, I am in possession of a Vectrex. It's amazing. If you don't remember it, it's a little vector graphics display. It's a little thing. You, you get these little plastic sheets that you put in there to, you know, have a color overlay. Um, and it's just a neat little device. The games aren't always amazing. Um, but they're, they're fun enough and it's cool to have a vector graphics system. Right. Yes. Fat Scout points out that Zen Pinball is doing an M are doing M rated pinball machines, but they're putting them out in a separate package called Pinball M because they don't want to do them as DLC for for Zen Pinball. Um, we had internal pitches about something called GameSpot M uh, for a while that I was all for. Uh, it came from them wanting to attract uh, alcohol sponsors. And the, uh, the legality around alcohol sponsorships at the time, I assume this is still the case, but I don't know for sure, uh, was that a certain percentage of your user base had to be above a certain age for alcohol companies to be able to legally uh, advertise on your website. And so you wanted to try to drag that age up. Nowadays, I think, you know, the average age of people reading video game websites is probably well over the age of 21 going to a website. But I was all for it because I was like, yes, let me cover fucking porn games. Let me, let me do fucking a bunch of super fucking weird shit, man. Um, and so I, I was, you know, on the editorial side of things going like, yes, fucking Yes. I very much want to do this. Like, I don't care if you're coming at me. I don't care if the reasons are because you want to make more advertising money. Like, great. Yes. Let's do liquor sponsorships. I very much wanted to do liquor sponsorships, sponsorships as well. Um, but that, it, just, that it never came together for one reason or another. I, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the actual reasoning was, but sadly did not come together. Davis from Syracuse writes in and says, against my better judgment, I decided to re-download Wiz Khalifa's Weed Farm onto my phone. I spent an embarrassing number of hours playing this game back in 2017, but I haven't thought about it since. So I decided to check back in on it, see if it's had any meaningful changes since launch. To my surprise, the game is still being updated with bug fixes as recently as seven months ago, but the game is pretty much exactly as I remembered it. When was the last time you checked in on Wiz Khalifa's Weed Farm? Maybe a month ago. Unlike Davis from Syracuse, 
I I have had I have had uh, weed uh, Wiz Khalifa's weed farm installed on my phone this entire time. Ask app not to track. <laughs> weed farm wants to use Facebook.com to sign in. All right, we're, I need to close this. I need to close this now. Uh, Wiz Khalifa's Weed Farm is a bad idol game. It's really, it's really bad. They added like a Canadian area and you go there and it's it, hockey pucks or I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, it's, not, it's not a great mobile idol game. But I played it for kind of a long time. The, the, no, I'm sorry. That's, Wiz Khalifa's Weed Farm didn't do that. No, yes, it did. That's the one that did that. Okay, because there's also Weed Inc., I checked in on Weed Inc. I did not check in on Wiz Khalifa's Weed Farm. Move the clocks ahead four hours, and then a, then a blunt gets smoked on the middle of the screen, and then cartoon Wiz Khalifa shows up here and says, for $5, I can fast forward one day. Nice. You got to rub the weed to get the money out of it. And then a drone flies overhead, and you tap the drone for more money. And then you got to rub the weed. to get the money out I can buy a new car but that's cosmetic so why would I waste anyway uh, it's a terrible game but I, it turns out I did not revisit it recently but I have had it installed this entire time I revisited Weed Inc which is actually kind of a worse game than Wiz Khalifa's Weed Farm but uh, well what are you going to do Uh, let's see. Here's a, you know, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to say here, I, I'm not going to tell you how to live your lives, but I'm going to say, don't trust anyone in your life, be they a podcast host or anyone really <clears throat> that refers to a podcast as a pod. If they go on to say something along the lines of let's cast a pod. Don't. It's done. You don't. Those aren't. That's not good. Um, I was, is, is, this is something else I saw scrolling through TikTok today that there was someone on there going like, well, you know, they're uh, well, here on the pod. And I was like, fuck you. Um, anyway, I was reminded of that because I just, I got an, I, I, here's an email that came in. Hi there. I came across your pod and I think you were doing an awesome job. I built an AI app that lets you generate content from your podcast blogs, social media posts, summaries, and more. It makes creating content for your podcast really fast, two or three minutes. Can I send you a link where you can try out the app and generate a blog post and other content for free? No credit card required. Let me know if you're interested, smiley face. <clears throat> yes, also, yes, if someone uses the term netcast because they refuse to use the Apple term podcast, those are also bad people. I think cast is okay. I think if you're calling it a cast, we're here on the cast because that's, you know, newscast, broadcast, like that's, that's just a, a regular, that's just a, a fairly regular term. Shoutcast, of course. Of course, shoutcast. Icecast. Eli Kreitzen says, Sega in the 90s was on some real shit. Genesis CDX makes no sense. That's it. That's the whole email. I don't know. Like Genesis CDX, it was a tiny, it was a tiny Genesis and a Sega CD that goes in the same thing. Like, you know, JVC Wonder Mega is blown the fuck out, man. Because that thing's huge. And it does the same thing as this tiny little thing. 
And you could take that tiny little thing and use it to listen to CDs portably, I guess, if you if you wanted to. For the amount of money it costs and the, as fragile as it was, I think that's a terrible fucking idea. Um, also, not a not a great, you know, you, you can you can put a 32X in that thing, but you got to jump through some hoops to do it. It's a little funky. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, between the CDX and the Sega channel and some of the others. Yeah, the Sega was fucking weird. Some might say desperate at certain points in their uh, lifespan. <clears throat> last email. Eh, second to last email. Eh, maybe third to last email. Oh, we'll see. <clears throat> Adam in the UK writes in and says, Would Activision be around today if it wasn't for Call of Duty? Talking about a claim and how you were bummed to see them go more so due to their presence in the golden era of gaming rather than the games themselves, and I totally get that. It was upsetting seeing companies we grew up with disappearing, and there was a period where it was happening quite regularly. My question is, do you think we'd be talking about Activision the same way as Acclaim, Midway, Infogrom, and etc. if it wasn't for Call of Duty? If so, what other companies do you think wouldn't be around today if it wasn't for that one game, and what was that game? Well, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say because Tony Hawk was popular for them through that era. Uh, Guitar Hero was very popular for them through that era. And then, you know, they they controlled Blizzard. And so World of Warcraft would, you know, would have been in there. Uh, Starcraft, you know, the the Blizzard suite of games would uh, would certainly be a thing. Maybe they would just be known as Blizzard. Maybe they, the Activision name would have gone away. If it started to stink up the joint and they would have renamed themselves to Blizzard. Um, but I think, you know, in Activision, if we if we kind of remove Blizzard from the, the conversation, at least temporarily, I think an Activision without Call of Duty would be an Activision that would have had to have figured something else out. And so the the thing that happened is that they never had to figure other stuff out. Um... And even so, they did. You know, remember, like, they published Skylanders for a handful of years there, and that was doing quite well for them, right up until it wasn't. Um, you know, obviously Guitar Hero would, you know, maybe they would have found ways for Guitar Hero to work longer than it did, you know, maybe because they would have had to have figured it out instead of it being more like, oh, well, you know. You know, maybe Tony Hawk would have had to have, they would have had to keep making them because they're like, shit, what do you know, what do we, we gotta, we gotta turn this around, but we can't stop making them because we gotta turn this around. Um, maybe they would have stuck with some of the licensed games that they were doing, the Spider-Mans of the world and, and whatever else. Um, you know, more Spyro. Maybe they wouldn't have gotten to a point where they owned Spyro even, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say, but, um. Yeah, maybe they'd still be making Transformers games if it wasn't for uh, for that. I don't necessarily think that they wouldn't be around, though. Uh, Corey writes in and says, Just writing in to say, Mad Decent Radio from Saints Row 4 is still in heavy rotation. Does this mean I still support Riff Raff? Probably kind of does. It probably kind of does. Uh, there were some al there were some riffraff allegations. I uh, I don't know those those didn't seem to stick, but you you definitely don't hear people talking about riffraff anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I that that mad decent radio station. I feel like that was the right place at the right time. Uh, and, uh, that was a solid station in that game. That was at a time I was very conflicted about that because I was always like, man, Diplo seems like he sucks, but also some of the music he is at least partially responsible for is music. I have found myself liking at least a little bit, if not a whole lot. And uh, so I, I was always very conflicted about, and still am, 
about Diplo. Wesley Diplodocious, whatever the fuck. Anyway. Um, you know, three loco. It's quality stuff. It's fun. It's fun. Well, you go back, I don't know, man. You go by the fucking, all that Baltimore fucking, all the holotronics and all the other, you know, there's just, there's a lot of fucking, there's a lot of, yeah, he likes good music. That's the, yes. Alma Corsaria. <laughs> he likes good music. Yeah. When, when I, yeah, I, I was not like a huge major laser fan, but when, uh, the fuck is the name of that? Express yourself. By Diplo. Uh, featuring Nikki Dabi. I think that's that's a great. I think that that's that's a great track. And a fun video. If you like seeing ladies upside down against a wall, might I recommend the video for Express Yourself by Diplo? Um What else is going on? <laughs> We were talking about Killzone Shadowfall, and Andrew writes in. And says, yo, I played through that thing for the first time this year, and it kind of whips ass on a PlayStation 5. It reminded me of the good parts of Far Cry 1 and Crisis. Story was dumb as hell, but the part where you shoot the dudes was exceptionally sick. It's also the only Killzone game that doesn't have the weird artificial input lag that makes the other games feel so slow and sluggish and heavy. Yeah. That's something you forget about those other Killzone games is that like they just you feel like you're fucking walking through mud the entire time. Uh, Gorilla's lighting tech in that game is staggeringly impressive, even but even by 2023 standards. Anyway, game's all right. It's not especially long. Maybe give it a spin whenever new releases slow down a bit, or don't. Yeah, no, that's yeah. I if I own a digital copy of Killzone Shadowfall, I will at least reinstall it. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, I, I remember really not liking that game. I remember really not liking uh kill zone shadow fall or really being like disappointed by it. And like, Ugh, I don't, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, um, that is in fact going to do it for the emails. So thanks everyone. Remember, podcast at guard.bike is the email address for you to reach out to me with an email. If you want to get your email read on the pod. God damn it. Um, then, uh, then send something in. Um, I'm still fucking sick. This, this sucks. My son is is uh, you know in in worse shape than I am, but we're we're all getting better. And it's just I um, I I really want to have a fucking firm schedule and say like, hey, here's what's next, and here's when you will see me next, and all this other shit. But I just don't have it right now because everything is you know still weird. the The good news in theory is that we're just about like the, the baby is just about put on enough weight, um, to where she is probably not going to be in danger. Like if she were to get sick, it would not be as bad because she has put on enough weight to, um, you know, to, to be able to handle it, you know, it might still be a, a bad situation and, and when, what have you, but it would not be a, a, a in theory, not be as dangerous. So that's that's the hope. Um, so, you know, all all of this weird jump through hoops we're doing and hiding and you know trying to keep people from getting sick and all this other insane stuff. Like it's uh, it's sometimes it seems a little ridiculous because it's like, oh, just everyone got a cold. It's like people get colds all the time. We'll just get colds, but like with the baby in, in that position, you know, we just we can't. So it's, it's led to a lot of very frantic maneuverings, a lot of expensive maneuverings, like last minute, like we've got to get out of here. We need a place to, you know, like we've got to figure this out right now. And that's been, uh, 
it's it's been a long it's it's been a very long month. Um, so I, I that is my way of saying I don't know when you will see me again. I want to get some Nintendo games ranked. It's making me crazy. Um, so hopefully I will be back with you sometime on Friday. If not, um, you might you might catch me at night again. Uh, as, as long as I'm feeling better, because over the course of doing this, now I feel, you know, like my nose is, is getting all stuffed up all over again. Um, so, this has carried on a lot longer than I thought it would, but uh, we have to, we have to be near the, the end of this shit. So, um, as, as soon as, as soon as we're all back in the saddle, I just want to get everything back on track and uh, and get some get some yeah, get some some clarity in my life, get some get some steadiness, some constancy in my life. I don't know what I'm doing day or night anymore because everything has just been so fucking nuts. I'm gonna go lay down. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna drink some water. I might uh, I might take a hit of some nasal spray. I uh, I've never really done nasal spray before i never really got into that because i don't i don't do drugs and so i don't like shit shot up my nose because it always makes me i don't like getting water up my nose in the pool either it just burns i don't like it i don't like it um but my wife bought some some vix i don't know sinex or something like that and it was just sitting on the counter and after a few days of my nose being plugged up and staring at that thing I finally cracked it open. I was just like, God damn it, man. I have to, I have to do this. I need to be able to sleep. I haven't slept in three days because my nose has been so stuffed up. And I hit that shit. Changed my goddamn life. I understand now how people get hooked on uh, Afrin and shit. Like nasal, I, I understand how people get hooked on nasal spray. Because my nose has never felt that clear before in my entire life. It was like my nose, it was like I connected my nose to heaven. And it was just going in through my, you know, and, and so, um, but you can't do that more than three days. Otherwise, um, you end up in a situation where you're... They call it rebound congestion. Your nose gets fucked up from using it too much. So don't. But people legit get fucking hooked on it. It's, it's, it's fucking scary shit. So um, with this stuff, they say you can take it twice a day. I did not take it this morning. Um, and, uh, but I, I might. Uh, I might take a little hit of it before bed. Yeah.